Decision 2019, WGN News presents Chicago Mayoral Forum. And good evening to you. Welcome to tonight's Mayoral Forum. I'm Lourdes Duarte coming to you from Steinmetz College Prep. And I'm Taman Bradley. Twelve mayoral candidates are joining us at our 90-minute, hour-and-a-half forum where we will question them on issues that we hope help you make up your decision on who you will be voting for in the February 26th election, now less than seven weeks away. Yeah, and it takes a lot of people, a lot of organizations to put something like this together to get all 13 candidates on stage on the same night. So let's thank them. First of all, it's the Hermosa Neighborhood Association as well as the Northwest Side Housing Center and also 36th Ward Alderman Gilbert Villegas who is here tonight with us. Thank you. All right, we're going to let him do a quick introduction before we start tonight's forum. So thank take it you. away. Well, I appreciate it. First of all, I want to thank everyone for coming out. I want to thank the candidates for coming out. And as you know, we're in a school. So those that have an excused absence, we're going to forgive. <laughs> those that don't have an excused absence, I want you guys to remember that during election season. So why are we doing this forum here in the northwest side of the city at Stymus College Prep? Reason why is because I've had a lot of candidates call me and want to talk to me about their candidacy. So I figured, you know what, instead of just talking to me in the back room, why don't we have this meeting out front with everyone here from the 36th Ward and have them have an opportunity to express their, their what, it, what is it they, they want to do for the northwest side of the city and more specifically for the 36th Ward. So, as uh, Lourdes mentioned, we cannot do this alone. I have Steinmetz College Prep Civic Department, Steinmetz JROTC, Steinmetz Local School Council, North Side, Northwest Side Housing Center, Metropolitan Family Services, Belmont Craig and United, Hermosa Neighborhood Association, Veterans of Foreign Wars, Armed Forces Post 832, which I'm a member of, State Representative Luis Arroyo Sr., Cook County Commissioner Louis Arroyo Jr., Alderman Millie Santiago and Metropolitan Water Reclamation District Commissioner Marcelino Garcia. So I want to make sure you give them a round of applause for all their support. So, Lourdes and Taman, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll take it off your hands. Really appreciate it. We are going to touch on education, finance, and crime, but we will begin with opening remarks. Each candidate, you have one minute. All right, but it's important to mention that this is a forum. It is not a debate. That means there will be no rebuttals, no follow-up questions, and of course, the candidates are seated in alphabetical order. So let's begin. The candidates, again, have one minute for opening remarks, and that means Dorothy Brown, you go first. Good evening. John F. Kennedy said a rising tide lifts all boats. But that's not happening in the city of Chicago, where schools, economic development, and criminal justice is concerned. Fannie Lou Hamer said that she's sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I say, enough is enough. I'm a Democrat, but I'm an independent Democrat. And I'm unbought, and I'm unbossed. And I have the perfect confluence of background, experience, and the heart to be the mayor of the city of Chicago. I'm an attorney so I can handle the legal lawmaking body of the city council. I'm a CPA and an MBA so I can handle the $8 billion budget. And I've been managing a $100 million budget for the last 18 years. And I have the heart because I came from a set of poor and uneducated parents who taught me the value of hard work and dedication. You're going to hear, hear some very, a lot of flowery words up here, but this is not an oratorical competition. This is about someone that can bring fairness and equity and justice to the entire city of Chicago. Vote for Dorothy Brown. Hope for all Chicago. That's what it's all Dorothy about. Dorothy Brown, thank you. thank you very much. We move on to Gary Chico again. One minute. Thank you very much. My grandparents came here from Mexico to the south side of Chicago to work in the stockyards. My brother and I learned the value of the work ethic. When I was called to serve this city as chief of staff, where we put more police on the street and brought about community policing, Chicago Public Schools, where we turned deficits into surpluses, built schools throughout the city, and raised student performance in each of six years. It, it taught me a great, great deal. But none of those things were accomplished by, 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 by simple work. It was hard decision making. And what, we, what I'm seeing right now from people like Tony Preckwinkle and Susan Mendoza is raising our taxes. We're seeing soda taxes, sales taxes, property taxes go through the roof under the backs of our working families and citizens. I'm fighting to be the mayor of this city so I can protect 
protect them and maintain their quality of life. We are not an ATM machine for lazy governing. Thank you. Thank you, Gary Chico. Bill Daly, one minute. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Alderman and the sponsors for this evening and my fellow uh, participants on the stage, and I thank especially all the people of 36th Ward who showed up. I'm Bill Daly. I grew up in this community in, of Chicago. My entire life has been as a resident of Chicago. I'm proud of that. My kids, grandkids, and like so many other families, we're proud of the city. It is a great city, but it cannot continue on the track it is going without major change. People are fed up with the crime that's occurring in, throughout this city. They're fed up with the school system that isn't providing what they pay for. They're fed up with the taxes, as was stated by Gary. There's no doubt about it. We've got to make serious changes. I think my background, I've not been a career politician or a career bu bureaucrat. I've, most of my life has been in the private sector. I was President Clinton's Chief uh, Secretary of Commerce and President Obama's Chief of Staff. I'm proud of that, that tenure in government, but we need to make, make some basic changes in this city for the next four years. Bill Daly, or else your we're time is up. Amara Enya, you. you're up next. One minute. My name is Amara Enya, and I'm running for mayor of Chicago. And it is an honor to sit on this stage, not just as someone who will tell you what we can do or what I can do for you, but to lift up the voices of those of us in communities who have been calling for true change for years. Our campaign is a people-centered campaign. And in light of recent developments, I want to lift up not only young people, but the organizers who have pushed for change in communities across the city and whose voices have largely been overlooked. We say that in order to get different outcomes, we need a different kind of leadership that is born of a validity of our experiences and that recognizes that public policy must emanate from the ground up. This is our opportunity. This is a unique chance for Chicago to move in the right direction with leadership that actually reflects our values of equity, of justice, of transparency, and of government that is responsive to our constituents. That is the heart of our campaign, and I'm hoping to be able to share Amara your voices. Inya, thank you very much. Bob Ferretti, one minute. If you're satisfied the way this city is run, then I'm not your candidate. When I was alderman of the, the most diverse ward in the city, I created more than 8,000 jobs, worked for excellent schools, and voted no on a lot of bad budgets. I'm running for mayor for the same reasons I ran for alderman, to solve problems. Except the problems are worse now than they were then. We're, when I was alderman, I worked for you. I was the reformer. The, I, the record shows I was the most independent alderman. Where were these candidates when I raised issues on the council floor and in public forums over the last 10 years and talked about every reform measure that they've just discovered? From term limits to reducing the size of the city council to making aldermen a full-time job. They either fought me or sat silently on the, on the sidelines. This election comes down to this. Who will you trust to run and the, and the future of our city? Do you want more of the same from the political ruling classes who make friends and relatives rich, or do you want someone Thank who you, will sir. work for you? LaShawn Ford you. is up next. Chicago is a beautiful city, but we need to heal as a city. There's been so much crime, so much violence, and so much neglect in every community. I'm so happy to be um, a teacher by profession where I taught at Bridge Elementary School just north of here, and I enjoyed spending time here at this school with basketball games and, and events with the students. So as a um, state representative for the last 12 years, it's my goal to make sure that we heal the city of Chicago, make the city of Chicago healthy, make the city of Chicago safe and make the city of Chicago affordable, making sure everyday working families are not attacked by the city that they are supposed to be taken care of by. So as your mayor, I pledge to you that we will have a healthier, safer, and brighter future in the city of Chicago. Thank you. LaShawn Ford, thank you. John Kosler, one minute. Hi, everybody. My name is John Kozlar. I am 30 years old, and I am the youngest person to ever run for mayor in the history of Chicago. We have a tendency of electing the same people over and over, and nothing ever changes. The, the issues that we face in 2019 are the same ones we faced in 1980, and that's crime, education, and city finances. We have corrupt politicians that put our city last and to put their friends and family first. 
If we elect Bill Daly, Susanna Mendoza, Gary Chico, or Tony Prankle, Preckwinkle, we're gonna end up talking about the same issues in the next four years, and that needs a change. We need to put Chicago residents first and these corrupt politicians last, and I'm here to do it. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Lori Lightfoot, and it's my great pleasure to be with you tonight. Now more than ever, we need change. I got into this race back in May when, May when Rahm Emanuel was still on the ballot. I didn't wait on the sidelines until after Goliath was stayed. I got into this race to talk about ethics reform, and I talked about it early on. And I talked about the corruption related to Ed Burke long before the federal investigation became public. And I led recently 15 separate alder, uh, aldermanic candidates to take a people's first pledge, to talk about the need to have good government and put people first, finally. Now, if you want the same old, same old, you've got an a la carte menu of choices. But if you want a leader who will put you first, who will take on the tough char uh, challenges and work hard to make Chicago a place where everyone has opportunity and everyone can thrive, then I'm your candidate. I'm Lori Lightfoot, Lori Lightfoot and I want to be your mayor. thank you very much. Audience, a reminder, hold your applause. Gary McCarthy, one minute. I am not a politician. I am not a bureaucrat. I am a 35-year public servant. I've worked at the top of three major cities in this country <clears throat> for 17 years. I'm a leader. I've been a manager since 1985. My dad was a World War II Marine and a police officer. My mom was a registered nurse who, as she said, was forced into early retirement at the age of 79 when she was treating a patient, fell down and broke her ribs. As she said, forced into early retirement. I know the value of hard work. I learned it from my parents. This city has three major problems, and we can't separate them. We have a crime problem that is out of control. There have been 658 more murders over the last three years than the previous three years when I was the superintendent of police. We have an education system that's failing. We have a tax rate that's gone through the roof. I can no longer stand by and watch what's happening in my adopted city. I have a two-year-old son here. I refuse you, to raise Gary him in McCarthy. these conditions. We move on to Susana Mendoza with one minute. Thank you, good evening. My name is Susana Mendoza. Just to be clear, Gary, it's Susana with an A. It's not silent and neither am I. Um, I also want to say that I'm running for mayor because the future of Chicago is at stake. And I'm interested in focusing on not just the next four years, but the next generation. Um, you know, I love this city with all my heart, and the issues that plague this city, the issues that we all grapple with, violence, under-resourced schools, high property taxes, they're not just issues to me, they're personal. Um, I live in, right around this neighborhood. My son, who's six years old, my husband and I are proud parents of him, and he goes to a neighborhood CPS school right in the 36th ward. Uh, it's Miser Elementary, and we're going to be CPS parents for the next 13 years of our lives. Um, I was born in a neighborhood, a tough neighborhood, and I was, I, my parents felt they had to flee because of violence, and no family should have to leave because of violence. I'm committed to be a mayor who is from the neighborhoods, understands them, and puts them first, and I'm very proud to represent the people of the city of Chicago towards the next generation. I hope I can have your support. Susanna Mendoza, thank you very much. Paul Vallis, one good e minute. Good evening. I've been generally worried about the city for a long time, so worried that I found myself constantly thinking about Chicago and its problems. And with my experience in successfully managing multi-billion dollar budgets and managing giant school systems, not to mention natural disasters, it seemed morally wrong to just sit around hoping that things would get better. So in spite of our rather intimidating mayor and his rather intimidating millions and Chicago's rather intimidating machine, I did what few of the other big name candidates did in this race. I found the courage to jump into the race and run against Rahm Emanuel. Now, the race obviously looks a lot different today than it did last year, but one thing is the same. I'm still the only candidate with the skills and the track record to manage this great city from day one. The voters have to treat this election like a job interview because that's what it is. My vision for the city is very different than the vision we've been fed by the machine. My vision is to give the taxpayers of this city value for their dollar and ensure fairness in every neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul Vallis. From him, we move on to our last candidate, Willie Wilson. Uh, my name is Willie Wilson. Uh, I do not believe in raising taxes on people who cannot pay taxes, number one. I believe that we have to balance the budget through ways of 
creating a tax system that would lower taxes to the corporation as well as our citizen in the city of Chicago. I believe we got to have the casino tax marijuana, legalize it, uh, and making sure that we could bring these things into the city of Chicago to make dollars to help pay for a pension for police officer, pension for the fire department, pension for the school teachers. I believe that we have to be fair with our citizens of the city of Chicago. I believe I have to be honest. I'm a business person. I was raised up poor, a sharecropper. We work our way through. Violence have got to stop. I believe in order to take care of violence, you got to have economic equality in all neighborhoods and not just leave out a few. All right. Thank, Thank, Thank you, you, Willie Wilson. Thank you. All right, before we begin, we should note that Tony Preckwinkle is not here. Originally, she confirmed, but in the last few hours, she notified us that she had a conflict, and so she is not here. Neil Solis Griffin, we're not really sure where he is. Jerry Joyce had a pre prior commitment, and he hopes to actually make it here so we have his seat available. Because of the large number of candidates, not everybody will get a chance to answer each question, but you'll all have a chance to speak. So let's get started. Dominating the news over the last two weeks is the federal extortion charge against Alderman Ed Burke. Many of you have personal and professional connections to Burke. How do you assure voters you are the right candidate to change a political culture dominated by clout and corruption? Bill Daly, one minute. Yeah. Uh, look at everybody. Many, most, almost all the people on this stage will try to separate themselves from people when they get in trouble. Okay, I think it's a, it's the time now to make fundamental changes in our system of governing. We can play around the edges, change finance reform or whatever, but the fact is, and I, I laid out a plan the other day, to fundamentally begin to change the system. Instead of 50 aldermen, we should have maybe 15. There's only one other city uh, in the top 10 cities in the country, that's New York, and there are three times the size of us that has 50 aldermen. So we have to look at the system differently. If you just want to make marginal change, go ahead, that's great. But I think it's time we look at a fundamental change. That, all the other things about full-time aldermen, no outside income, all of that. But we've got to take a serious look at this, whether it's time to make fundamental changes in the way we govern. Just about everybody up here is going to try to say they never heard of Ed Burke. Just about everybody Daly, up here thank you has. very much. Your time has expired. Susana Mendoza. How do you assure voters you are the right candidate to change a political culture dominated by clout and corruption? One minute. Sure. Well, I'm focused on the future first and foremost, and I've put forth a set of plans called my Future Now plan, and we're going to be rolling out an ethics plan that covers a whole gamut of things. I, too, believe that aldermen should serve in a full-time capacity. They make plenty of money. Um, they get... Uh, compensated more than accordingly. And I think that we have to look at this holistically and say, you know, we can't have elected officials who are running for office to profit themselves. Anyone who wants to run for public office should be motivated by one simple desire, and that's to make people's lives better. And every day when I wake up, I ask myself, have I done everything that I can? Uh, or what, what, what can I do today to make people's lives better? And most importantly, end my night asking me, did I do everything that I can? As the next mayor, again, I think that the last thing that we need to do in this city is to hire a caretaker mayor, someone who's going to be around for four years and wash their hands and call it a day. I'm focused on the next generation. We'll put every ounce and energy I have into cleaning up the system and look forward to leading this city towards better days. Thank you, Susanna Mendoza. Gary Chico, one minute. The floor is yours. Same question. Same question, please. I've had a record of performing whenever I've been asked to serve by either Mayor Daley or Governor Quinn. I believe that public service is about sacrifice and you do what it takes to model behavior and do the best job in those organizations. I've probably served in more capacities locally for the government here than anybody on this stage and people can look at my record. In terms of ethics reform, I ran in 2011 against Rahm Emanuel when I thought that needed to be done. And one of the big parts of our platform then, as it will be now, is ethics reform. We suggested that every piece of data that affects a city contract go on the city website. It was called Sunshine Chicago. I'm, I'm again suggesting that that be done. I'm also suggesting that the time-honored privilege of aldermanic prerogative be looked at. It's way past time that any one individual has that unilateral power to grant a license, a permit, or a zoning change. I think it's time to cope with that today. Okay, thank you so much, Gary Chico. We're going to move on to a very quick round, a lightning round, if you can call it that. So it's a yes or no answer. Everyone has to answer with just yes 
or no? So here's a question. Do you support calling for a ban on outside income by elected officials, specifically aldermen? And answer the question when I go down the list. So Dorothy Brown, yes or no? Or I will skip you. Yes. Gary Chico. Yes. 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 Amara yes. Enya. LaShawn yes. Ford. Yes. Yes. Lori yes. Lightfoot. Yes. Gary indeed. McCarthy. Yes. Susanna Mendoza. Yes. Paul yes. Malis. Yes. And Willie Wilson. Uh, yes. And let me call your name before you answer the question. Here's the next one. Do you believe Ed Burke should resign his position as alderman? Again, yes or no. We'll start with you, Dorothy Brown. Yes. No. Gary Chico. It's his decision. Bill Daly. Uh, it's his decision. Amara Enya. Yes. Bob no. Fioretti. No. LaShawn Ford. No. John Kozlar. Yes. Lori Lightfoot. It's a voter's decision in the 14th Ward. Gary McCarthy. No. Susanna Mendoza. Yes, and voters will choose for him if he doesn't. Paul Vallis. Voter's decision. And Willie Wilson. I believe all the politicians in City Hall now should resign. Yes or no, sir? <laughs> I, that, I think yeah, that may tough. have been a yes, Laura. Okay. All right. <laughs> so let's she's move tough. on to the final question. Same thing, yes or no. Do you support term limits for aldermen? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. You didn't call That's my okay. Name. Yeah. Gary Chico. <laughs> yes. Bill Daly. Yes. Amara Enya. Yes. Bob Fioretti. Yes. LaShawn Ford. Yes. John Kozlar. Yes. Lori Lightfoot. Yes, I do. Gary McCarthy. Yes. Susanna Mendoza. Yes. Paul Vallis. Yes. And Willie Wilson. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you to all of you. Now you will have one minute to answer this next question, so I think you'll like that a little bit better. Uh, last year, Chicago Public Schools reported carrying over $8 billion in long-term debt. The teacher's pension fund was half empty. So what is your specific plan to shore up CPS financing, and would you close more schools across the city? I'm going to begin with LaShawn Ford. Again, you have one minute. The answer to the question, no, I will not close more schools. Secondly, we have to make sure that we have a mayor, and as your mayor of the city of Chicago, a former teacher and a um, student of Weber High School very close to here that closed down, I know the impact of closing a school and what it will do to families. And so what I would do is make sure that we work very closely with the state of Illinois to bring more money back to the city so that we can support our schools. I will work with the federal government to make sure that we bring more money back to Chicago so that we can fund our schools. I would also make sure that we stop the waste, fraud, and abuse that's happening in CPS. And that starts with making sure that we eliminate the appointed school board and have an elected school board because there's a lot of money that's being wasted in our current system. Thank you so much, LaShawn Ford. From him, we move on to Amara Enya. Same question. What is your specific plan to shore up CPS financing, and would you close more schools across the city? The answer to closing schools is no. Um, as having worked as an organizer with many people whose schools were closed, we saw the negative impact that was revealed years later. It is harmful for those students and disruptive for the families in those communities. As it relates to CPS finances, the first step is to stop with the gimmicks that CPS has used to paper over their finances and cover up the true cost of educating our students. Second is advocating for resources both at the state and federal level so that we get the resources financially that our students deserve. Third is an equity audit in CPS to show where capital expenditures and programmatic expenditures are making place, to, are taking place to make sure that students who have the highest needs are getting access to those resources. And finally, the culture of corruption that's been allowed to thrive in CPS that's caused cost us $20 million no-bid contracts, uh, numerous lawsuits in the hundreds of millions of dollars because of sexual abuse. Those scandals cost the city and cost CPS financially. We have to uncover those things as well. Amara Enya, thank you so much. We move on to Paul Vallis. Same question, sir. Well, great. Very quickly. Um, since the state is now picking up pension obligations for Chicago Public Schools going forward, they've stopped the bleeding, number one. Number two, with Pritzker now as governor, I'm confident he'll fully fund the new school aid formula, which could prove if Chicago Public Schools enrollment begins to increase, it could prove to be a windfall. Uh, so those two things will make a big difference. When I took over to Chicago Public Schools in 1995, I inherited a four-year, $1.4 billion structural deficit. I left the district with a billion dollars in cash balances, Gary and I. So I 
know how to construct five-year balanced budget plans. Secondly, I would develop a growth budget. In other words, we were able to grow enrollment by 30,000 in six years, which generated a windfall because all of our schools became extended day, extended year community centers. And because we put magnet programs in neighborhood schools like Steinmetz that got a military academy program and an IB pro, uh, program. It's the only six years in four decades that the school district has, gro has grown. If the school district grows with the new formula, this, we will be able to write the finances. Paul Vallis, thank you. And from you, we move on to Gary McCarthy. Same question. So it starts with an audit and perhaps a prosecution once we figure out where the corruption has infected the budgets of the, uh, of the schools. Uh, second of all, uh, we have to have budgets that are adhered to. Anybody here who's ever been to a city council finance meeting, it has nothing to do with finances. We have to have budgets that matter. We can't just blow through them. We need to stop borrowing to pay our debt. In 2016, we bonded $500 million to pay for part of the operating budget of CPS. As a result, we're going to be paying $70,000 a day for something like 28 to 30 years in interest to pay that debt off. It's like taking your MasterCard and putting everything on it and then paying it with your visa at the end of the year. Um, we've got to stop political spending and do needs-based spending in all cases. I would not close any more schools. I would put resources right into the schools to correct the conditions. Mr. McCarthy, thank you. One last candidate to answer the same PS financing. And would you close more schools across the city? Willie Wilson, that is your question. You have one minute. <clears throat> We, we will open up uh, those schools that was closed down, maybe not all of them, but we'll put high technology in those particular schools. We'll balance the budget by bringing in uh, casinos and other businesses. We'll lower these taxes so people can stay into the city, the corporation can stay into the city as well. Our people leave from out of Chicago and pay high taxes or go to Indiana, Texas, and Arkansas. Those customers leave out the state. You got to understand business, understand the people. If you lower taxes, you keep your citizens in Chicago. If you lower taxes, you keep your company in Chicago. If you keep raising them, you're digging a hole. The politicians today must be able to balance budget. If they balance budget not with taxpayer dollars so much, but you can balance budget with your own dollar that you make, you'll be okay. A lot of problems with uh, the, the dollars in terms of the school, the politician, a lot of them, the argument, the mayor, is plain on crooked. Willie Wilson, thank you very much. Staying with our theme of schools, last year the Chicago Tribune shined a spotlight on abuse at Chicago Public Schools, and a report by the district later showed broad failures at all levels. They've made some adjustments. Do you think they made enough changes to protect students, and what will you do differently if elected? One minute, Lori Lightfoot. No, the CPS has definitely not made enough changes. I sat with a group of um, people who were involved in the sexual assault space, and they frankly haven't gotten transparency. CPS is still playing the same old games. They haven't trained enough people to be able to respond to and investigate these cases. So things have to change. Uh, it starts with, frankly, the leadership focusing on and protecting our kids. It's simply shameful that CPS got notice a year ago in January about the sexual abuse scandal and then did nothing for five months to educate teachers, to protect our kids, to notify parents. So we've got to fundamentally change the way in which that's done. We have to make sure that we've got trained investigators who understand how to interview child victims and witnesses. We need to make sure that the process is a heck of a lot more transparent, and we got to bring parents into the process and arm teachers with the information they need to be able to educate, protect, and support the kids. There's a lot more that needs to be done there. Lori Lightfoot, thank you very much. Dorothy Brown, same question. One minute, please. I thought it was a travesty that um, the Chicago Public Schools permitted our children to be sexually abused. Uh, what I want to do is put in place an office with, that reports directly to the mayor's office to oversee uh, that portion of the Chicago Public Schools. And within that, I would ensure that First of all, that children are also trained. The issue is that children do, do not realize when they are actually being sexually abused. Uh, sometimes they think that that's actually something nice that's occurring. I would then also make sure that, th that I would have the inspector general that would be directly responsible for, that's out of that office, that would be directly responsible for ensuring that 
that every complaint is actually investigated. I will have a zero tolerance for sexual abuse. Every, as I do in my office, every complaint is investigated regardless of what occurs. And so that's what I would do in order to ensure that uh, sexual assaults would not occur in the city of Chicago. Dorothy Brown, thank you very much. One minute, John Kozler. Let me first say, it was, it was said earlier that Tony Preckwinkle had a conflict for not being here today, and that conflict was she knew that I was going to be here. And I'm tired <laughs> of, and, and I'm tired that we don't hold our politicians accountable. And the only reason why the CPS scandal was brought up was because these politicians got caught. And the only time when they take action is when they're forced to. And that's wrong. We need to stand up as one Chicago and hold our politicians accountable. And we do that by electing them out. And that's what we need to do in Chicago now. Not four years from now, but in 2019. And if we work together, we can no longer have abuses of, of taking advantage of students. We can no longer have abuses of corruption, of people being paid to play to make themselves better and their families. No, that's wrong. I'm going to put Chicago residents first and again put these corrupt politicians, four of whom are on the stage today. Thank you, John Kozlar. Audience, please do not applaud. Hold your applause. Bob Ferretti, one minute, same question. I serve on the Children's Advisory Council, which deals with sexual assaults, children who have been sexually abused. And it was formed in, in the 1990s under Mayor Richard Daley, the state's attorney, at the, uh, and people who were concerned with abused kids. They, got, they were just received a contract dealing with this issue uh, and dealing and training people within CPS. Those that abuse those kids should be in jail. And this started in the 1990s, if you look back at what the report says, and who was running our school system, people here. You know, we, we need to, and they're getting, at this point, about 200 complaints a week. What is CPS doing about it? We need to find and go to the core problem of what's happening. They couldn't even, you know, vet all their people. We need change. We need to put them in jail. Thank you, Bob, for ready. Your time has expired. Thank you, Lourdes. They are doing a really good job at staying on time, so we're proud of you guys. Thank you. Uh, let's problem. move on to a little lightning round, and it's a yes or no answer once again. So here's the question. One issue many of you have talked about is moving the CPS board from an appointed board to an elected board. Do you support making a change? The answer is yes or no. I will call your name and you give me your answer. Dorothy Brown, let's start with you. Yes. Gary Chico. I've called for a hybrid school board. Bill Daly. A different form, not totally elected. Amara Enya. Yes. Bob Fioretti. Yes. LaShawn Ford. Yes. John Kozlar. Five elected, four appointed. Lori Lightfoot. An elected where p parents have an opportunity to sit at the table. Gary McCarthy. Yes. Susanna Mendoza. Yes. Paul Vallis. A hybrid board. Willie Wilson. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're turning now to crime on the streets of Chicago. Chicago police say two young men were parking their vehicle near Cicero and Augusta around 4.30 a.m. Sunday morning when three armed men walked up to them and demanded their vehicle. What is your specific plan to combat brazen carjacking carried out by juvenile offenders in this city? Willie Wilson, one minute. I think crime is, is, is caused because the fact of it is that we don't have enough uh, economic development contracts and job within certain community, particular minority community. If you take the dollars uh, and making sure that the equity of our city, the makeup of our particular city, get back into our community, making sure that the tip dollars and everything else not just put downtown or in a wealthy community. I think that we hire too many police officers and try and keep going up. I think we got to do something different. We got to put resources and dollars and contract in those particular uh, community. And its citizens must also take their own businesses within the community itself so that the job can turn over and over and people can continue to work. Willie Wilson, thank you very much. Gary McCarthy, what is your specific plan to combat brazen carjacking carried out by juvenile offenders in this city? I I'm shocked I got a crime question. Um, it starts with accountability. There's no accountability in the criminal justice system here in 
Cook County. We see it over and over again. Yesterday, I saw on the news where there was a man who got three years for punching a conductor on a metro train. And that happened in the western suburbs. It didn't happen here in Chicago, where we can't even get people prosecuted for things like murder without getting more than, uh, without getting sentences of more than six months. Criminal justice reform is at the heart of fixing the criminal justice system. That means putting violent criminals in jail. That means uh, pulling back on, on low-level narcotics uh, offenses. The bottom line is the criminal justice system for juveniles is 10 times worse than the criminal justice system for adults. We need absolute criminal justice reform. We need to use rapid DNA so that we can quickly solve those cases. We need to work with the feds to do federal prosecutions where appropriate. And we need to close those cases very quickly, chasing everyone. Gary out. McCarthy, thank you very much. Bill Daly, floor is yours. One minute. Yep. Uh, this is probably the single biggest issue facing the city, and every neighborhood is affected by it. We had almost 3,000 shootings last year, 500 plus murders, way beyond what New York, which is three times the size of our city, or LA, which is four million people, we're only 2.7. We need an aggressive strategy around sentencing, tougher gun laws, we need better training for our police department, using technologies more. If it was up to me, I'd have a camera on every block in this city. I use drones to help the police officers and help the citizens of Chicago be safer. The third part of my plan, you can go on dailyformayor.com and see it, is a real violence prevention program. It has worked and helped the police departments in LA and in New York, and I've committed to put $50 million in that with a deputy mayor for violence prevention to work with the young men, mostly black African-American from 18 to 27, to change their lives and, and have a concerted effort to make a real change in this issue. No doubt about it, we need more jobs. Bill Daly, thank you very much. Amara, in your same question, one minute, please. It is amazing to me that we will spend $40,000 to incarcerate one individual, but we cannot find sufficient funding for our schools, and then we complain about crime. There is a root cause to crime in this city, and it is directly linked to investment. Preventative measures mean children have to have options, both in school and in training, so that they can function in the economy legitimately when they leave. If we do not provide that infrastructure, which is the city's responsibility, then we cannot wonder why young people are doing carjackings. We have put a lot of money into investing in police infrastructure, yet, if our legislators and if our government actually address the public policy failings across the board from public health hazards, exposure to lead in the water and manganese in the soil, to lack of, so of, of mental health services and behavioral health services both in schools and communities, if they did their job, they would make the job of police easier. This is a question of investment, not a question of policing, and the city has to get it right. Amara Inya, thank you very much. And we're going to stay on the topic of crime and police. Here's your next question. The Chicago Police Department is facing a consent decree following fallout from the fatal police shooting of Laquan McDonald. Do you support the current agreement? And what is your specific plan to improve the relationship between police and the communities they patrol? Gary Chico, I begin with you. You have one minute. I support the consent decree. I think it's a blueprint to make Chicago's police department better and the relationship between our communities and the police better. I think we need a change in leadership in the Chicago Police Department. We failed. Witness the fact that we need a consent decree. Witness the fact that we have a 17 percent homicide clearance rate. Witness the fact that CAPS has gone away. And I was working in the mayor's office when we brought about CAPS. We need to bring it back. But it's not just that. We have to get these illegal guns off our streets. The gangbangers that are committing crimes with guns are out of control. And what we're finding is that more than 60 percent of the guns used in these crimes are coming from over the border. I've said that if we can't get Indiana and Wisconsin to work with us, we sue them. And that includes the Cabela's gun shop right in Indiana, right in Hammond, Indiana. We can no longer take this. But understand, at the end of the day, it's not just a policing problem. We have to do some of the things that Willie talked about. We have to invest in our neighborhoods, give people a chance to work in a positive job. And I believe if we do that through programs like the Ready Initiative, you'll Gary see improvement Chico, in crime. thank you. LaShawn Ford, same question, one minute. Thank you. Yes, of course, I support the consent decree, but we know that it does not go far enough. And what we have to do is make sure that we work with the FOP and we must work with the state, the city, and all of the elected officials and the community to make sure that we have a fair contract so that we can make all of our communities safer. 
there's no doubt that the consent decree falls short of doing what it was supposed to do. And of course, when President Obama was um, in office, his um, federal Justice Department said that there was racism in the police department. That racism not only jeopardizes the police, but it also jeopardizes the community. And so we need healing in this city. We must do everything that we can to have a fair contract with the FOP, and we can no longer leave our police unprotected, no longer leave our communities unsafe. And so it would be me Mr. as mayor. Ford, thank, thank you. you. Lori Lightfoot, you're up next. Same question. Yes, the concept of a consent decree is right, but the, con the consent decree is drafted, needs sub substantive changes. I've outlined what those changes are. Some of them are this. One, it doesn't deal with um, the accountability issue that we've got. We're spending 50 to $60 million every year on settlements, judgments, um, and attorney's fees. That's to the side. That needs to be part of the consent decree process. It allows for shooting into crowds, which is a mistake. It allows for chokeholds, which is also a problem. And it doesn't have a foot pursuit policy, which is also a problem. There are other substantive changes that need to be made, and I'm hoping the federal judge, before he signs it, will make those changes so that we have the ability to transfer transform the police department. I'm the only candidate in this race and on the stage that actually has a track record of, su of success in dealing with police reform and accountability. The work that me and my colleagues did on the Police Accountability Task Force is the underpinning for the consent decree. I know how to do this work, and I'll be ready day one to make the necessary changes to transform Thank you, our Lori police Lightfoot. department. John Kozler, you're up. Yeah, the, the provision that I do agree with the consent decree is more training. I think the police officers will also agree uh, that the more training we have, the more benefits that will be for the Chicago Police Department. But I also think that we have to let the police do their jobs. They have a very, very hard task in front of them, and we continue to make it more difficult for them to do their jobs. They've been doing an excellent job overall, and there are some bad apples. Let's not be, let's not be wrong about it, but let's hold those individuals accountable, but not the whole police department, because there's a lot of good men and women on the police force. The one specific idea that I have is a 60-40 idea. So right now, there's t the problem is there's tension between the police and the communities. But when we, they work together, that's when everybody benefits. Right now, the criminals are benefiting. So in order to police in that specific di district, 60% of the police officers have to live there. Now they're not seen as outsiders. They're seen as community members who know the neighbors. They know the streets. They know the, the blocks. They know how uh, to live there, and they're investing in the neighborhoods. And that will reduce the tension over time. Thank you so much for your answer. Our next candidate is Susana Mendoza. Same question. Thank you. Well, number one, I do support the consent decree and uh, will work towards implementing it. Um, number two, uh, the Je Obama Justice Department's key recommendation in that was to provide better resources and training, better resourcing and training of our police department. That is a critical component. You cannot possibly expect police officers to only work off of the training they receive in the academy, put on the vest, wish them luck, and expect great results. These men and women, first of all, anyone who puts on the uniform, whether it's in the military or in our police department, deserves our respect, and we need to honor that sacrifice that they're willing to lay their lives on the line for people that they have never even met. I have family in the police department, and I want them to come back home safely. But I also want to make sure that every mother in this city whose kids may look different than I do also feel the level of comfort to know that they will come home safely. This is going to be a tough job, but I know what it's like to be that scared kid who needs to rely on police for a safe environment, and I know what it's like to have family on the force. And I think it's time that we have a mayor who understands both sides of the equation and will work hard to implement. Thank you for your time. This next question is also yes or no, but I'm feeling generous, so I'm going to give you 30 <laughs> seconds to answer it. So here's the question. Would you replace Superintendent Eddie Johnson? And I will go down the line. Dorothy Brown, you have 30 seconds. I will give Superintendent Johnson an opportunity to interview for that job. Okay. Gary Chico? I already called for his removal. I've laid out the reasons why. I think we failed on a number of, 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 of accounts. But I want to echo what John Kozlar said. There are an awful lot of good police officers that risk their lives every day for us, and we have to keep that in mind in any kind of reform that we undertake. Okay. Bill Daly, 30 seconds. Um, I believe that uh, Superintendent Johnson has served this city well for 30-some years. I don't think we should politicize the superintendent's job. He's got five months left or whatever it is till the new mayor takes over, and I don't think that should be thrown into the middle of this 
political season. Let him do his job and let the police officers do their jobs. Thank you, sir. Amara Enya, 30 seconds. Much like what's happening in City Hall on the fifth floor, we're talking about systems change and culture change. And often that requires changing the people because the mindset has to be aligned with the values of that institution. If the current leadership cannot adopt the mindset, the values that we have, especially as it relates to transparency, integrity, then you have to change those individuals. Thank you. Bob Fioretti. Yes, I am in favor of the removal. I say this with some hesitancy. And, I, and here, here's what my caution is, because we should not make it a political. We need a professional to run the department. Wherever we find that professional, that professional has to have the integrity and has to have the ability. That person has to come forward and make sure we have the correct hiring, training, supervision, and discipline of this department. Thank you. LaShawn Ford. You know, we can't just um, destroy the gains that we've made under the current superintendent. So what we would have to do is make sure that he understands that he has to reapply. We can't leave our city vulnerable. So what I would do is make sure that we hire the best superintendent for the city. And I believe that we should give young people rising up in the ranks the opportunity to be the leader in that police department. So as mayor, we will hire the best person for the job. Thank you, sir. John Kozlar. I'm going to treat Mr. Johnson just like any other individual that applies to be the superintendent. And the, the big part that we need in Chicago is a fair process. So if he is the best person for that job at that time, then I will support him. But if he is not, after we do a national uh, recruitment of the top position, that's what I'll go by. It's fair and, and be uh, honest with the city of Chicago. But I will tell you that, and I know I have nine more seconds here, I'm going to bring a tidal wave of new ideas to City Hall, and that's what's needed in the city. Thank you. Lori Lightfoot. No, I don't think that we should be even talking about this now. We need stability in the police department. We need the police officers to have confidence in their leaders. We need them to do their jobs. The next mayor is not going to take office until May. By then, this, the planning for the summer violence season will be underway. Obviously, um, Eddie Johnson um, has a very difficult job. I'm very candid with him about the challenges. I will continue to do so. But I think a proper evaluation and a transition has to happen and not reflexively play to the crowd Thank and say we're going to fire time. him. Gary McCarthy. I promoted Eddie Johnson twice. Um, he's done a great job with the community. I am incredibly dissatisfied with the fact that we've completely lost the crime issue here in Chicago. Um, I would do what municipal law actually prescribes, which is this time make him apply for the job instead of getting the city council to change the law for one day so I could appoint whoever I wanted to. So I would invite him to actually apply this time. And just like every other at will in, in city Thank government, you, he will Susana have an opportunity. Mendoza, you're next. I think it's irresponsible at this point in the campaign when none of us have been elected mayor or yet made it to a runoff to be making personnel decisions on probably the most, if not one of the most important jobs in this city. I think the superintendent has a really incredibly tough job. I do believe that as mayor, I can guarantee you that I'm going to look to hire the best and the brightest. And whoever that superintendent is, is going to be a person, whether it's him or someone else, that shares my vision of having to restore community trust between the police and our, and our communities so that everyone comes home safely at night. Thank you. Paul Vallis. I think it's pretty cowardly to call for his resignation by the same candidates who failed to criticize Rahm Emanuel for his mismanaging and his degrading of the police department, an administration that didn't fill 2,000 vacancies that decimated the detectives division, that decimated the sergeants division. So at the end of the day, you know, Johnson came from Cabrini Green and he rose through the ranks and he didn't want the job in the first place. What makes us think that he's going to want to stick around? So at the end of the day, I think it's pretty cowardly to make him the scapegoat. No applause, please. We move on to Willie Wilson. Same question. 30 seconds. Well, I would do it this way. We would bring in four superintendents of police, split the city in four different areas so you can get closer to your people. I think you got 50 aldermen in the city of Chicago and only one superintendent of police. I think you need four. Also, in terms of my replacing him, anybody, anybody who is a friend associated with Ron Emanuel got to go. 
Willie Wilson, thank you very much. We're now going to move on to the city's troubled finances. Chicago is facing nearly $1 billion in new required annual retirement payments in five years. Mayor Emanuel laid out his blueprint to help meet the obligations that is changing the Illinois Constitution, Pension Protection Clause, and modifying the yearly 3% cost of living adjustment. Do you back that idea? And if not, what is your plan to come up with new money needed to meet pension obligations? Amara Enya, one minute, please. I do not back that idea of amending the Constitution. I think the city has not focused on actually having a revenue consistent with the needs of the economy for the future. Uh, we have not reevaluated re our tax structure, which we should. The property tax system is actually antiquated. Brick and mortar stores are no longer the go-to. That's a reality of the economy that we have to face. So how we tax the city must change. We need a public bank for Chicago so that we can fund our own infrastructure. That's billions of dollars that we now spend with private banks that could otherwise be recirculated into our economy. We need to expand the small business sector, be able to issue low interest loans to entrepreneurs so that they can generate revenue for the city. We have to amend the way we generate fines and fees so that we're not unduly burdening those who can least afford to pay. Until we focus on a growth economy that is inclusive, where people have entry points at every stage, we will continue to have a revenue problem and therefore a financial problem. Amending the Constitution is a late-term fix for a long-term problem. Amara Enya, thank you very much. LaShawn Ford, modifying COLA and changing the constitutional pension protections. I absolutely disagree with the um, proposal. What I think we need to do is make sure that we make people more, um, less dependent on government and give them opportunities to be included in our economy. When we do that, we grow our economy by making sure that people pay taxes and not be dependent on taxes. So we want to make sure our communities are healthier, safer, and when we do that, we reduce our liabilities on the police department. We do everything that we can to have high quality education so that more people are connected to the workforce. When we do that, we have more people paying taxes. When we do that, we also have an opportunity where there are more homeowners able to save their homes and stay in their homes so that we no longer have to foreclose and take those properties off the tax roll. What we have to do more than anything in this city is close the door on the corruption and the cronyism that's shutting too many people out of opportunities in Chicago. Well, Sean Ford, thank you very much. Gary Chico, one minute, same question. I would not amend the Constitution. A promise to our employees is a promise to our employees. We have to keep it. Uh, what I would not do, however, to raise the revenue is take the lazy approach that I've seen by people like Tony Preckwinkle and Susana Mendoza by just raising taxes and putting more bricks on the back of our citizens. They can't afford it. We have to be, we owe the citizens our creativity. I've suggested a land-based casino in Chicago that the city owns. It may generate $300 million a year for us. I've suggested legalizing marijuana, which I think this state will do. We should get our share of the taxes. The downtown skyscrapers are being assessed at half of their value, half of their value, which means it rolls on to all of us. We have to get that straight. It's a corrupt system. It has to be made to work again. I've also suggested a 1.2 percent tax on million-dollar home sales that can go in to help our city budget and help us meet these obligations to our pensioners. It's the right thing to do. Gary Chico, thank you very much. Paul Vallis, the mayor's pension blueprint. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, you're not going to uh, you're not going to change the uh, constitution no matter what. I think Pritzker has already done thumbs down. Uh, I've laid out a comprehensive plan which for, for, first of all focuses on a state agenda. If if the governor is going to raise the income tax, we need to make sure we don't get shortchanged like we did last time where they didn't give us an increase in local government to zero fund and when they diverted co corporate property replacement tax re revenues away from local governments. And if you are able to secure those revenues, those fair share revenues, and you're able to finally get over the next five years pension funding equity for the teachers along with the downstate teachers, you will have reduced half the long-term increase in base funding that you have to provide. You can then easily, I believe, adjust the budget from a, a, a st spending base standpoint by at least 5%, so you can, in effect, address the pension issue and then cap property taxes uh, and, and build a uh, budget uh, based on natural revenue growth, uh, as well as your so-called casinos and cannabis, which I do not want to fund pensions with because they're unreliable revenue Paul sources. Paul thank you very much. Willie Wilson, same question, one minute. Well, let me just be open and honest. Uh, look, lower taxes keep business 
into the city. Lord, tax to keep our citizens into the city. The situation that if, if we face with the day is our politician is uh, taking money from the citizen. White collar crime, not being honest with its citizen. You got people like Tony Preckwinkle, of course, Susan Mendoza, run for an office and still change their mind and run for mayor. At the same time, drawing a paycheck when they're getting paid for another job. That's not right. Right. It's not right. Okay? You got Ron Emanuel raised the taxes eight times. Nobody says nothing. What we got to do, replace the argument, replace the politician that is doing wrong, investigate them, and lock them up. Willie well, the Wilson, thank fits, you very right? much. I will uh, reread the question. Mayor Emanuel laid out his blueprint to meet pension, new pension obligations, changing the Illinois Constitutional Pension Protection Clause, modifying the 3% cost of living adjustment. Do you back that idea, Dorothy Brown? If not, what is your specific plan? One minute, please. No, I do not back that idea. But I also want to say, John, Tony is not here because of me, not you, because of the, <laughs> because of the corruption that's occurring related to the petition challenge system being controlled by the county in which the Information Systems Department reports to her. But let me just say this. And, and so, uh, but as far as that's concerned, no, I do not support uh, Rahm Emanuel's idea. From a financial standpoint, I have called for a city-sponsored lottery. Uh, which will be technology-based, uh, which will permit people to actually uh, purchase our lottery ticket anywhere in the world, which could, could bring in trillions of dollars uh, and balance our budget and, and, and uh, also solve the pension crisis. I also talked about mini bonds and, and uh, crowdfunding and various creative ideas for bringing revenue to the city. We must be, I have the financial acumen so I can bring a financial vision. I'm going to put in place a long-term financial plan, not just a short-term plan, fixing it year after year, but a long-term financial plan. Dorothy Brown, thank you very much. We want city. to take a moment and welcome Jerry Joyce to our forum. Please take your seat. Go ahead. We're going to stay on this subject. Bob Ferretti, you're going to get a chance. You'll have one minute. The Pension Protection Clause and the COLA. Well, actually, uh, the mayor proposed four things. I, I call them the four C's. Uh, cannabis legalizing, a casino, uh, cash out of the pension obligation bonds, and uh, the uh, constitutional amendment, all of which are really uh, pie in the sky. Legalizing marijuana will not give us a, a lot of money. In fact, under a report issued on November 9th, it shows that at best, all the municipalities in the state of Illinois will get about $20 million. What we need is, uh, and this is the problem. Whoever gets to be elected mayor on uh, May 15th, by September 1st, has to find 400 million new dollars. They can't be playing games. We need, we, you know, we could talk about a casino, but that's way in the future. You know, we got to look at a commuter tax. We got to look at video gaming and lift the ban. 70 million right there. A commuter tax would generate about uh, 300 million dollars. We need to be realistic about what we're Bob doing. Ready. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Let's move on. And let's stay on the topic of taxes. In 2015, Chicago approved the largest property tax increase in city history. If elected, would you agree to a property tax? Freeze, and I'm going to begin with Willie Wilson. You have one minute. Well, I'm, I'm one person that when people raise taxes ten times, uh, they got to itch. They people lose their home. I'm one to go and pay people taxes to help them stay in their home. So, what have got to be done? We got to lower these taxes so people can keep their homes. We, we have to think like we, we, we're human. All right. When, when you can put in the city of Chicago, people making $100,000 a year, their regular budget, but over time they're gonna get $200,000, something is wrong. When you don't take and have people who lie, who cheat and steal, not being open and honest with their citizen, that's the problem we have. I think we don't have a budget problem, we have an integrity problem with our politician. That's got to change. Mr. Wilson, thank you. Same question to Dorothy Brown. If elected, would you agree to a property tax freeze? One minute. As it relates to property taxes, what I feel is that 
the reason why we have a property tax crisis is because of the lack of economic development. I want to make sure that we have fair and equitable economic development throughout the entire city of Chicago. Uh, take economic development out of the hands of aldermen. Uh, just because a person gets elected alderman does not make him, an economic, him or her an economic development expert. Get away from that ward level approach. I call for eight planning districts. And so as we raise the health and wealth of our communities, then we will increase the tax base. And so therefore you do not have to increase the tax rate on all of the other, uh, on all of us. And so, so I won't say, I, I'll say that I won't increase the tax rate because I'll increase the tax base of this city by bringing fair and equitable economic development throughout the entire city of Chicago. Dorothy Brown, thank you very much. Jerry Joyce, as we bring you into the forum, a reminder, no rebuttals, no follow-ups. I will ask you the same question. If elected, would you agree to a property tax freeze? Uh, sorry for being late. Thank you. Um, you have one minute. Property taxes uh, have never been higher. Uh, I don't see why we should freeze them at this level. I think our goal should be to lower them. That's not going to happen right away. We have major financial problems going on right now but we need to acknowledge that we cannot solve these problems on the backs of residential property owners in the city of Chicago. Thank you, sir. John Kozler, you're next. We have to stop taxing our people. I mean, we come up with so many different taxes. Last year we had the soda tax, uh, the, the bag tax, and soon enough they're gonna have the shoelace tax where they're gonna tax you to, shy your, to tie your shoes. <laughs> that has to stop. I, I'm, so many people in Chicago are hurting. And what we need to do, is make changes and we can only make changes when we elect new people and let's be honest the reason why we're in the position we are now is because the mismanagement mismanagement of the politicians that needs to stop we have to stop making it more difficult for people to kick people out and if you raise people pro people's property taxes they can then say hey you know what we can't afford to live here anymore and then we lose good people and if you raise people property taxes that means people's rents go up we need to stop doing that we need to put chicago first and not tax our way out of this problem Thank you so much, sir. Let's move on to Lori Lightfoot. Same question, one minute. You know, I've never met Jerry Joyce before, but I think he's right. The goal ought to be to lower property taxes, not maintain them at the high level that they're at right now. But we really can't have a serious conversation about property taxes until we fix the broken and rigged and corrupt property tax assessment system. That's where we need to focus our attention and energy. But the truth is, we are going to have to have a conversation about revenue. Um, Gary Chico and others have talked about all these things, casino, legalizing marijuana, and other things, uh, progressive revenue, um, uh, progressive revenue ta uh, income tax. But the truth is, those things aren't going to come online in enough time for us to solve the problem. The next mayor is going to take, uh, take office in May, halfway through the budget cycle. We've got a structural deficit of $200 million, not 98, as Rom said. We're going to have to come up with progressive forms of revenue to address the immediate needs now in the budget and also the pension crisis. But before we do that, we have to assure the taxpayers that we are going to be proper fiscal stewards of their hard-earned tax dollars. Thank you. Lori Lightfoot. You know, I really like your lightning round. Can I do one? <laughs> you can steal it. Go ahead. All right. How about that? We're going to go down the line. Yes or no. Do you back a Chicago casino? Dorothy Brown. Yes. Yes, I called for it in 2011. Bill Daly. Yep. No. Yes, and I called for it in 2010. Not in poverty areas. Uh, yes, uh, dedicated to the unfunded, unfunded pension liabilities. Yes. Yes, as long as the city owns it. Yes. Yes. Yes, as long as the city owns it. Yes, as long as it's... Uh, the uh, citizens of Chicago own it. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's keep this going. Uh, again, back starting with Dorothy Brown. One uh, minute. Yes or no? Do you support amending the Illinois Constitution to allow for a progressive income tax? Dorothy Brown. I'm I'm not interested in amending the Illinois Constitution for yes yes anything. or no. I'm sorry. I, yes or no? Yes. Uh, no. Okay. I'm sorry, it's not one minute, it'll be yes or no for this. Gary Chico, yes or no? No, taxpayers can't take anymore. Bill uh, Daly? Uh, yes. Amara Enya? Yes. Bob Fioretti? No. LaShawn Ford? Yes. Jerry Joyce? I'd have to see the governor's proposal. John Kozlar? No. Lori Lightfoot? Yes, the current system is unfair. Gary McCarthy? No. 
Susana Mendoza. Just to be clear, was the question, do I support amending the Constitution for a progressive income tax? Yes. Correct. Yes. Paul Vallis. You don't need to because you can amend the existing income tax and make it progressive. Willie Wilson. No, I got nothing to do with raising taxes. Next okay. question. Next question. Do you support legalizing recreational marijuana? Dorothy Brown, yes or no? Yes, but I would say we need to make keep sure that we have keep it an yes addiction. No, Gary no, Chico, Gary something Chico. related to addiction. Thank you for the yes, Gary Chico. Yes, I was the first person to call for it in this Bill race. Bill Daly. Yes, we could be happy and we could Amara be broke. Anya. Yes. <laughs> Amar Anya, was that yes. a yes? Bob Filretti. Yes. LaShawn Ford. Yes. Jerry Joyce. Yes. John Kozlov. It's going to happen. L Lori Lightfoot. Is that a yes or no? Uh, I, my thing is I agree with people if they want to yes smoke weed, no. smoke no, no. weed, no, but no, my thing, I just don't want kids Wait to be in, introduced okay. to it at early right. age. <laughs> was that yes or no, just to be clear? That was yes for adults, Lori no for Lightfoot, kids. yes or no? Yes. Gary McCarthy, recreational marijuana, yes or no? Yes, with conditions. Susanna Mendoza? Yes. Paul Vallis? At risk of getting hollered by my mother tonight is watching, yes. yes. or no, okay. <laughs> Willie Wilson, yes or no? Are they going to smoke it anyway? Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. They get rowdy at the end of the forum is what happens here. All right, so, we're going to move on to some community questions. A lot of the people here had some questions for you that we wanted to make a part of the forum. So let's start with this one, and what we'll do is we'll give you a minute to answer it, and I'm going to pick, let's say, Bill Daly to answer this first question, and I will address it to a few of you. Participatory budgeting is a process where community members directly decide how to spend part of their public budget. Alderman Villegas and Steinmetz students utilized it to help build the new field out front of the school. If you were mayor, would you support the expansion of this kind of budgeting across the city of Chicago? Would you reward additional funding to aldermen and schools that use it? Bill Daly, again, the question is yours. You have one minute. Yeah, I, I think it's a definitely, and the example you use with the alderman and the school is a good example that I think it works. Uh, whether I would expand it without some controls, obviously we've got to make sure that the aldermen do it in a way that's transparent and open and with the community. So I, I think it's a good concept and I think we ought to expand it beyond uh, where it's been. Thank you, sir. Let's go on to Gary McCarthy. Same question. I, I, I'm concerned about, we talked about aldermanic prerogative already. I'm concerned about the amount of power that aldermen actually have today. We're seeing problems with that. Um, as long as there's community input, as long as there's stop gaps put in place, as long as there's oversight to ensure that no more corruption is actually happening, I would support it. Okay. Let's send the question to Susana Mendoza. If you were mayor, would you support the expansion of this kind of budgeting across the city of Chicago? Would you reward additional funding to aldermen and schools that use it. You have yeah, I would support it. I think democracy is a great thing, and the people who live in these neighborhoods have a vested interest in making sure that their neighborhoods work for them. So the alderman is elected to be a representative of the people, right? Not to be a top-down approach. And as mayor, I won't be top-down. I want to shape the city's future together. And as mayor, I would not only just support that, but I also think that I dedicate resources from the mayor's office to working with those community leaders who want to work to frame a, a plan of action on what they want to see in their neighborhoods and to help them get the financials as to what certain parts of their plan would cost. Because when people know how their tax dollars are being utilized or what the plan is for those dollars and they get to see what the return on an investment would, would be for their neighborhood, then they have a more informed decision when even voting on what those participatory uh, projects would be. So yes, not only do I support it, but we'll put resources behind helping the aldermen be able to work out great plans and projects with those constituents. Thank you. Paul Vallis, you're up next. Same question. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would support it. What's important, though, is that you make the budgets transparent. Has anyone ever looked at this budget? It's almost intentionally so cumbersome and so bureaucratic and so convoluted in its format and the way it's laid out. It's designed to almost, uh, the information is there. If you can find it, you need an accountant to find it. So it's, it's also about transparency as well as community input. But I'll tell you something, you know, local school councils were created, right, to govern local school budgets. I mean, what about training the councils and providing them with more support? They were given control of the Title I money and control over certain personnel decisions. For me, anytime you can empower the community and strengthen the community, you provide them with transparency, number one, transparency, real transparency. Number two, you provide them with real flexibility over how to prioritize their resources while always holding people accountable. 
always holding people accountable. So I'm for local empowerment with accountability. And at the end of the day, you've got the perfect ve vehicles. Every local school council should play a role in the formation of the local school budget. Thank you, Bob Fioretti. Thank you. I think it is probably one of the most unfair systems of giving aldermen $1.3 million. Why? If you're the downtown alderman, which your square miles is this big, it's fine. But if you're in the 10th ward, the 9th ward, where, you're all, where your ward is this big, you can't spend enough money to fix your ward. Participatory budgeting is a good concept. But you know what? We have to break this up and take it away from the alderman. We need to look. Uh, I was able to use our state reps, our state senators, get money for, uh, from them, from our county commissioners. I made sure every street, every alley, every sidewalk in my ward had proper maintenance unfair. Sometimes it treats political friends better than those that are the enemies. We have to be very careful. I know Gil does a great job up here, but a lot of the other aldermen don't. Thank you. Bob Filaretti, thanks very much. Let's stay with and do another audience question. Chicago's population is decreasing. It was 3.6 million in the 1950s. Now it's just under 2.7 million. What is your specific plan to combat population loss? Dorothy Brown, one minute. Well, I think that the population is decreasing because we have permitted crime to run rampant, rampant in the city of Chicago. It's decreasing because our, we have permitted our schools to go down, and so therefore people want to leave and find better schools for their children. And so my plan is related to uh, bringing up the school system, making it a high-quality system for the entire city of Chicago, for all of our children, uh, uh, first of all, and, and reducing the crime by overhauling the Chicago Police Department, uh, and of course, economic development, uh, as we making it fair and equitable. As we build the health and wealth of our communities, we will build the health and wealth of our people, and then we will revitalize our communities, and people will be willing to stay. Thank you very much. Jerry Joyce, one minute. Uh, we have a pro proposal to incentivize uh, beat officers to remain on the same beat under one sergeant for 30 months. That will be true com community policing. That will allow a period of getting to know the community they are serving and vice versa so that when we investigate crimes, there will be witnesses that will testify that will um, talk to the police officers and help solve these crimes that are going unsolved. The clearance rates are atrocious, everyone's well aware of that, and that has direct impact on the safety of our city. Um, one of the biggest problems right now is they can't get witnesses to talk to the police, and that's because they don't trust in the competence of the police because too often the same criminals that perform a shooting on one day or perform the same shooting three weeks later, and the people in the community know who's doing that, but they have no confidence that they're going to, that the crime's going to be solved. And in fact, why should they put their own safety at risk? Thank you very much, Jerry Joyce. Gary Chico, one minute. What's your plan? Population loss. First of all, we have to keep the city affordable. Right now, people are leaving for four basic reasons. They can't afford it. They're fearful. The schools are not working for them or their communities don't offer, haven't been invested in to offer them job opportunities. We have to deal with all four. Number one, affordability. I've talked ad nauseum here tonight about tax load that people have on their back. They can't take another brick. We have to be sensitive to what people are experiencing out there. Let's be careful on the taxation of our citizens. Two, crime. I've called for a number uh, in my safety plan, a number of measures to make our city safer. Community policing will lie at the heart of that. Three, investment in our communities. We have communities that haven't been invested in in 50 years. It's time to start doing it. I'll have specific plans for what I'm going to do in each of about seven communities that haven't experienced any investment in five decades. And then finally, the schools. We are going to bring our schools back today. I released an education plan. At the center of it is bringing back vocational and technical education so that we can give people a chance to work. All right, thank you very much, Gary Chico. Susana Mendoza, one minute, same question. Thank you. Number one, we need to address violence because if people don't feel safe in their neighborhoods, it's the biggest incentive to leave. I'm a product of that. My parents felt they had no choice but to leave the neighborhood to keep us safe, and it wasn't my choice to leave, but it was my choice to come back and make a difference. Uh, number two, uh, we have to get to the f uh, fundamental root causes of violence, and to do that, I've put forth a plan. Please check it out, Future Now plan that deals, it's called the 50 New Initiative that will take the 50 most underutilized 
uh, and under-resourced schools in Chicago and create a holistic approach that'll keep a longer school day where kids have access to supper, uh, arithmetic, and extra reading while their parents have wraparound services provided to them with social service providers, counseling, and job placement services and training. Um, the rigged and corrupt property tax system that frankly is probably one of the reasons why Tony Preckman is not here tonight, uh, that she rewarded, frankly, the bad behavior of an assessor who created the reason why many people are underwater in their homes today. Thankfully, we have a new assessor who will be able to launch an attack on that, but we've got to keep property taxes down. Thank and you, that's Susanna Mendoza. Thank you. Thank you. Lourdes. Okay, we'll move to another question. Again, from the audience, from the community, you will have one minute to answer it, and we've sort of touched on this one a little bit earlier, but here it goes. Do you support amending the Illinois Constitution to allow for a progressive income tax? If so, how would you use your position as mayor to put pressure on the state to make that change? We that. And you can take a minute to answer it. So let me start with Bob Fioretti. Uh, my answer is the same as it was before, no. Uh, and I do that because it's gonna take several years. It's not gonna impact our budget. You know, real estate property taxes are killing our people. And at the same time, lack of education, and when I say it's killing, it, it, it depresses the value of the homes. You can't sell your homes in parts of this city anymore. And the problem gets to be that with lack of educational opportunities in some of the communities, then you're, you're totally shut out of a system that allows for jobs and economic growth and opportunity. We need to come together and formulate a, a, a way to deal with the problems. We have a spending problem here in the state. We have a spending problem here in the city. We need to rein in expenses. We have to build our economic opportunities by bringing in small businesses, bringing in large businesses. And by expanding the tax base, we will create better citizens for our city. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, John Kosler, same question. Yeah, uh, so I do not agree with uh, progressive income tax but the issues that we face in Chicago is that we only invest in downtown. We do not invest in our neighborhoods. And that needs to change. There are a lot of residents who want to stay in the city, but we, we, they don't feel that they're being treated fairly by the politicians. And that's because when politicians get elected in Chicago, they step on a pedestal and they look down upon all of us. And we don't deserve that. We deserve better. Chicago is a beautiful city. I've lived here my entire life. It's just we have very ugly and corrupt politicians, and we need to change that. And that's the one thing in this election that I am offering. We also need fresh ideas. One of the things we talk about is the pension crisis, and that's the white elephant in the room. And I'm the only candidate that is suggesting a 401k for new employees, meaning if you are a current employee or retired, you are grandfathered into your pension because you paid for it. But if you're a new employee, starting from the year 2020, you have to go on a 401k plan. John Kosler, thank you so much. Willie Wilson, same question to you. If so, how would you use your position as mayor to put pressure on the state to make that change? Go ahead. You have one minute, sir. Oh, yeah, well, repeat your question one more okay. time. Do you support amending the Illinois Constitution to allow for progressive income tax? If so, how would you use your position as mayor to put pressure on the state to make that change? One minute. Okay, I, I, I said before, no taxes. You run people out of the city, no taxes. If you can take and put $8.5 billion in O'Hare to take care of corporate, you can invest the money in these neighborhoods to make sure that we have no taxes increases. We got to balance the budget out with affordable houses and things of that nature, bring people back to the city, make sure equality reflect all its citizens. This thing is really not hard. You know, when you take a look at it, you got to use common sense, but also you have to have people with integrity who cares about the people. You got to take and stop people from getting money from major corporations, other politicians, the unions, and things like that, to buy the people out, then they got to answer to the union or the corporation. That's why I put my own money so I won't be bought by nobody. I will serve the citizens of Chicago. All right, Willie up. Wilson. Thank you very much. Let's move on with another community question. Uh, if you are elected mayor and you sit behind the desk in that chair, who is the first person you will call? What will you say? LaShawn Ford. The first person I would call is the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and let's get it on with the community. I think the, what we have to do now is 
make sure that we give government back to the people in the city. That's the key. The key is to open up City Hall, open up the doors, and make sure that everyone has a say in government in the city. For too long, for too long it's been closed doors, and people have been getting contracts for years, years, and it's been leaving so many families out. And so my goal as mayor is to make sure that communities like this have an opportunity to not only go to college, but be able to be blue collar workers, to be able to be in IT, to be able to work as construction workers in manufacturing. So we will call on the community. All right, thank you very much, LaShawn Ford. Jerry Joyce, same question. Elected, first day on the job, sit at the desk. Who are you calling and what are you saying? Uh, I'm calling my wife and saying this is an awesome desk. <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, we got to get back to the neighborhoods, no question about it. That's what makes Chicago great in the first place. This focus on downtown has been going on for the past number of years is uh, really taking a toll on the citizens of our Chicago. We've been out there campaigning for the past several months, out talking to people in the neighborhoods, uh, listening to people, developing our, idea, our ideas, um, and we have nice plans for Chicago. We're, we're, we're going to be able to share more and more uh, solutions you have not heard from anyone else yet coming in the coming weeks. But if you go to our website, jerryjoyce2019.com, some are already on there. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Amara Inya, same question. The first person I call is the first people that I called before I decided to run for mayor. And that was the people that live in the neighborhoods that I live and work in. For far too long, their voices have been excluded. There's a frustration in the city because they have not been properly represented in government. They're looking for responsive leadership. All of the ideas that people are talking about will lead you to believe that none of these ideas actually come from community that they're brand new, when in fact, it has been that they have been blocked from the corridors of power in City Hall, and therefore their ideas don't get to be heard. My accountability is to the people in my neighborhood. It is to the people whose voices we have committed to amplifying. And so when you go into government, your past practice will dictate your future behavior. So that's the first group that I would call. Thank you very much. Lori Lightfoot, same question, one minute. Well, I don't know that there's a first person I call because I've been in an ongoing conversation with people all over the city since last May when I first announced. Um, and that conversation will continue um, when I'm in office. There are people in this city whose voices deserve to be heard. Um, I intend to be, as I've been my whole professional life, an advocate for those people. People in neighborhoods um, who have not been invested in, who lack hope, who lack opportunity. Those people are the people's, and those, their stories are their stories that I will carry with me every single day for the rest of my life, and clearly on the face, first day um, that I am in office. One of the most important things that we have to do, though, is we have to get a handle on the violence. Um, frankly, Gary and I are the only two people in this race that have any experience in local policing. 23,000 people have been shot in the last seven years. That's a staggering number that destroys uh, uh, families, destroys neighborhoods. So the first thing I will do in office is make sure that we implement our, my violence reduction All right, thank plan. you very much. Keep the phone calls short, we pay for them. Okay, let's go to the next question. And we're gonna go down the line, which means Dorothy Brown will stay with you. If you had to have a running mate, who on this forum, who is here tonight, would you pick? So you get to say a name. If you had to have a running mate in the race, who on this forum would you pick? Dorothy Brown. I'll give well. you 30 seconds. <laughs> a Lori Lightfoot. Okay. Gary Chico, 30 seconds. I'd pick that good looking bald guy at the end of the table over there, Paul Vallis, because we've teamed up before and have done some pretty extraordinary things in this city. Bill Daly, you're I up thought, next. I thought, you were you point, I thought you were going to point to me as the ball guy, okay? <laughs> uh, Lori Lightfoot. I've worked with her. I know her. I know what she stands for, and I believe in her. Amara Enya, same question. You get 30 <laughs> seconds. You've got 27. <laughs> 20 seconds left. I think I would have to pick someone who I've, wor someone who I've worked with uh, in the past 
and who I trust that actually is advocating and, and genuine about it. And I think that would be LaShawn Ford. Okay. Bob Fioretti, who would you pick if you had to have a running mate? Who on this forum? And Taman and I myself are out. So <laughs> somebody sitting right here with next to you. I, I, I would pick LaShawn Ford. Okay. LaShawn Ford? So I'm going to pick both of them. <laughs> I love both of them. And tomorrow we Jerry work so Joyce. well together, and so have we. Okay. Anybody who hasn't been in government for the past 20 years? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a few people on the stage, but uh, if I had to pick one, I think Amara is a genuine person, and I would love to have her on my team. Lori Lightfoot, you have 30 seconds. Who would you pick? There's a number of people that are in this race um, that I admire. I wouldn't pick anyone, frankly, who didn't have the courage to get into the race before Rahm Emanuel got out. So that would exclude a whole category of people. But I would be more focused on the qualities of the person, um, somebody who's got experience, integrity, um, who understands that corruption is and a real problem. And who is problem. that person on this stage? And, and as I said, I, I, I don't want to identify one person. There's lots of people that I admire. But the, the dividing line would be people that got into the race before Rahm got out. Then to Gary McCarthy. Who would you pick on the stage to be your running mate? I'm actually torn between Lori Lightfoot and Willie Wilson uh, for the same reasons that Lori is talking about. People who got into this thing for the right reasons, not for themselves. Um, in the end, Lori and I have worked together before. I have a lot of respect for her for that. She did a great job when she was overseeing the police board. Uh, Mr. Wilson has incredible integrity. He's a God-fearing man who's been very successful. So I would have to coin toss it, leaning towards Willie, because I Thank haven't worked with him you, yet. Thank you, Gary McCarthy. We move on to Susana Mendoza. Same question, 30 seconds. I'm not torn at all. I'm Ara Enya. I think she's great. I think she has bold ideas. I think she loves and cares about people. I think she has a pulse on what's happening in this city. And I think she represents the future. And this election isn't about a caretaker mayor. It's about the next generation. So I'd be pleased to run with her. Thank you. Paul Vallis, who would well, you pick? Well, you know, despite my affection for, for uh, people, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't select anybody who entered the race after Rahm Emanuel dropped out. Um, if you don't have the courage to you challenge, can only pick one. challenge Rahm, you, uh, so, you know, Amara, Willie, and, and, uh, and, and Lori, uh, you know, I would be comfortable with any one of those three. So they would be among my picks. Okay. Mr. Wilson, who would you pick? Well, what, I'm going to be open honest with you. There's a lot of people I like and a lot of people I don't like up here. <laughs> right? Right? Uh oh. All right? So, but I, I, I tell you what, I, I have a relationship with uh, a lot of people up here. And so I will go to the citizen first and ask for help and suggestion. <laughs> That's what I would do first. <laughs> right? You got five seconds. And I, 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 I just be honest with you. I'd be honest with All you. All right, thank you very much. Time's right. up. Let's, uh, let's do another audience question. That one was fun. Uh, serious topic here. What would you do to bolster mental health services across the city? One minute, Bill Daly. Well, look at the uh, centers that were closed. They've got, we've got to find a way to reopen them. It is an enormous problem in this city. You've got parts of the city, though, that are doing smart things by creating its own, the own mental health uh, centers and to, to take some of the tax money and be able to put it in, in certain communities and doing one in this ward. I think that's the future. I think the, the people have to decide this, but there's no question about it. As we've emptied the uh, jail, as uh, Sheriff Dart said, about 20, 30 percent of the people who are in the jail have mental health issues. We put those people back on the streets. Now, where you all celebrate the fact that the population of the jail has gone down, but uh, uh, what, what did we do for the people who we let out who have serious mental is issues? They're back in our communities. So I think we have to do something about it. We've got to find a way to re reopen some of these centers, get the state to step up and give us some more money to help us with that problem. Thank you very much. It is much. a serious problem throughout the city. Every community got the issue. Thought you were done there. Thank you very much. Gary McCarthy, same question. So mental health is part of a much bigger picture here. Each one of these issues is interrelated. Uh, we're losing population because of gun violence and high taxes. Because we're losing population, we're losing our tax base. Because we're losing our tax base, we're closing schools, mental health centers in the neighborhoods that need them the most, which is causing more gun violence. 
So we have to call a stop to that. We have to have a, a, an overarching plan that addresses all three of those issues, the education system, the gun violence, and the tax system. Uh, we actually need, there's money in the TIF system that has been wrongly used for a very long time. It's supposed to be used for uh, blighted neighborhoods, but for the TIF funding, those neighborhoods will remain blighted. Well, I got a, I got a, Navy Pier is not a blighted neighborhood, nor is Block 37, a block away from City Hall. We can take TIF money and put it into mental health centers, which will help us get to the place where we need Jerry to go. Jerry McCarthy, thank you very much. Paul Ballas, what would you do to bolster mental health services across the city? One minute. Well, first of all, let me point out, there used to be 19 mental health centers, not the 12 that they cut down to six. So at the end of the day, you know, I think every ward should have a mental health center, but they should be community-owned, community-run by not-for-profits, and I think money can, should be dedicated to that uh, at the end of the day. And, and it's not a budget issue. Look, two and a half million dollars would have reopened the centers. And let me tell you, the advocates will tell you, they, the city hasn't even been billing property, properly to get their money back from the state. So when Emanuel comes in and he blames it on Rauner or blames it on the state, they haven't been billing to get that money. So I would not only reopen the mental health centers, but I would use, uh, and you can reopen the mental health centers without raising taxes, just by allocating developer fee monies or TIFs. But what I would also do is when they legalize cannabis, I want to use the cannabis revenue to invest in community-based social services services, mental health, legal, legal, aid, uh, legal aid services, uh, early childhood services, adult and occupational training services to rebuild the community infrastructure to stimulate economic development. Paul Vallis, thank you very much. Lourdes, take us home. All right. So this is the last question of the night. I think you're going to like it. We've talked a lot about things that we need to fix with the city. What has gone wrong? We're going to talk about what you do like about the city. What do you like most about the city of Chicago? Pizza. <laughs> Hot dogs. And what is one thing you can do without? But let's do what do you like most about the city of Chicago? And we'll go down the line. Dorothy Brown. I like Millennial Park. I like, I like what has occurred there. I like the fact that it draws tourism. Uh, I feel that, of course, that we have to make sure that our, our economic engine downtown continues to flourish. Uh, but I want to make sure that, that, that we have fair and equitable economic development throughout the entire city of Chicago, that we're actually providing uh, economic development for those neglected neighborhoods like the west side Thank and you, the Dorothy south side. Brown. This so was I actually can, a one-word answer, which I think was my word? fault. I did not mention it. So. Uh, we'll go to you, Gary Chico. Your favorite thing about the city of Chicago, one thing you can mention. Do, do I get the 30 seconds? <laughs> no. Uh, I love the people in the neighborhoods of this city. It's very unique across the country, and I feel a warmth and a connection with them. Okay. Bill Daly. I think the easy access for all people to the lakefront, it is unique in the world, what we have, and it's an enormous asset that everyone can Thank enjoy. Thank you. Amara Enya. The unique culture in all of our neighborhoods, I think, is an untapped asset that we have. Bob Fioretti. I think the, uh, our neighborhoods are great, but I also would like to focus on the museums much more and, and make sure that they get out to our students. What do you like most about the city of Chicago, LaShawn Ford? I like the many possibilities if there's fairness and equity. Jerry Joyce. The neighborhoods. John I like the, the people of Chicago because we're kind, caring, and we don't like to be BS'd. Lori Lightfoot. I think that despite our challenges, what I've seen is people in the city have hope, um, and they have incredible integrity, and the working class people here really make this city a, a, a valuable, valuable place on the map, and we've got a lot that we can work with, and the talent okay. that is at the neighborhood level. Gary McCarthy. I like the people. And I thought you said one thing we could do without. Okay. I like the people. We could do without the politicians and the month of February. <laughs> That's Black History Month. Susana Mendoza. Hey! Hey! We're going to give you a bigger month. We're going to give you a bigger month. All right. <laughs> All right. We're going to give you a bigger month. Susana Mendoza. I like LaShawn Ford. No kidding. Um, I love Chicagoans. This is the greatest city in the world. Make no mistake about it. Everything about it is beautiful. It's skyline, it's people, it's possibilities. They're endless and we've got a lot of challenges, but we're gonna overcome it together. Thank you. Paul Vallis. It's people, uh, their warmth, their passion, uh, their uh, work ethic. Uh, it, it's, a, it, it's an extraordinary people with an extraordinary citizenry. Willie Wilson. 
I, I liked the idea of bringing the people together because we're too segregated in the neighborhood. I like the idea that we can uh, take on challenges that we can take care of ourselves and that we can reach those goals by bringing us all together, white, black, Latina, Asian American, all citizens of Chicago. And I think that is a very reachable thing to do. Okay. Willie Wilson, thank you so much. You can all agree on one thing. You like the people of Chicago. I want to thank all of you for being a part of this forum tonight. Uh, you did great. We had a wonderful audience. So thank you to everybody who came together to put this together. Thank you night. very much. Don't forget the election is February 26th. Whatever you do, vote. That's going to do it from here. We're going to toss it to WGN Studios. Micah and Joe, take it away. Saman Lourdes, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Our coverage of the very interesting Chicago Mayoral Forum continues right now. I'm Joe Donlon. And I'm Micah Matera. Let's get instant reaction to what we just heard from the candidates. Joining us now, WGN's political analyst, Paul Lisnick, Republican analyst, George Pearson, and co-chair of the Puerto Rican agenda, Christina Pasione Zayas. Thank you all for joining us. First of all, we're the, who won this? Can we say? Let's start with you, George. Honestly, I think Amari Anya did. She really came out as strong. She's very steady. I like her idea. She um, actually, I think she's got most of the votes up there of anybody that wanted to actually work with someone mm -hmm. on stage. Christina? I would totally agree with that assessment. I mean, she's able to clearly present complex ideas, um, yet common sense ideas. And it's like the, when she, the more she speaks, the more you want to listen and the more you want to dialogue mm -hmm. with her. You know, I think when you point to the people who are going to really come out of this thing in a positive way, so many of these folks were well known anyway, right? Um, so they could have not been there, but we would still know who they are. So I think the people who really benefited the most, Amara certainly one of them. She's known because of a chance the rapper support and all of that. But I also actually believe that John Kozlar came came out well because he's a lawyer, U of C educated, law school. John Marshall, twenty nine, twenty nine, youngest one. And you remember that line? And that's I the remember point. that he had the best one liners tonight, saying Tony Preckwinkle uh, wasn't there because of him. Right. You know, that's, of course, a ridiculous thing to say, but people will remember it. I actually think he'll get a boost out of this. What do you think about Tony Preckwinkle not being there? Take the, let's assume that she did have a conflict. Uh, how much does this hurt her not being Look, there? Look, right? you know, it, first of all, if she had a conflict, she had a conflict, but it um, looks like Jerry Joyce had a conflict. He mm -hmm. showed up late. Um, 757 you know, here, right? Tony, look, a recent survey by the uh, education folks uh, union showed that she's in the lead at 18%. So, you know, I, but I think it would be a mistake not to be here. So absent a legitimate reason for not being here tonight, I don't know. I didn't talk to her, um, that she should have been here. Uh, she's the one everybody was talking about when she wasn't there. She is the big fish, and uh, it would have been it would have been a mistake for her not to be there absent some true reason. We should also yeah. mention that Neil Salas Griffin yes. also did not show. So there were three of them, even though Jerry Joyce came later. Okay, we talked about the highlights, who we thought won, who we thought stood out. Who didn't do very well tonight, do you think? Paul, let's start with you. Well, I think some of the ones that you expect, I mean, when you have, uh, you had a lot of people, and the question, can we change the U.S., the Constitution, not the U.S. Constitution, the Illinois State Illinois. Constitution, mm -hmm. to fix the pension problem? A lot of things, and I've talked about this a lot on our air on my show, there's only one way to fix the pension problem, that is to change the Illinois Constitution, because other than that, a deal is a deal. Now, Gary Chico said, made that point, that there's a deal, he's right. But when you had, I think it was Paul Vallis who said, look, J.B. Pritzker already killed that one, he's not going to allow the Constitution to be changed, then the pension problems will simply go on forever. Um, so there has to be a means to fix it, and that's the route. So I was a little surprised at how many people jumped on board by saying, don't change it. What do you think about some of the suggestions to address this situation? The talk of a casino, the talk of the marijuana, uh, there was also complaints about the tax assessments on skyscrapers. Uh, what do you think about some of the ideas we heard tonight to remedy this? Of course, the assessments definitely need to be changed. The, the property tax assessment program throughout Cook County has been ridiculous. It's causing a lot of blighted neighborhoods outside of the city of Chicago within Cook County. So that's number one. If you don't start there, you'll have a lot of other issues. The second point in all of this, yes, they talked about, you know, changing the Illinois Constitution, not just for the pension, but also to, you know, change to a progressive tax. And that's one of the things that Willie Wilson kept pointing out. We, there are other avenues that we can take to actually change and bring in revenue. If you don't start there and actually bring in new businesses, you know, work with entrepreneurs, and, I, and we're talking about real small businesses. Again, Amara Enya talked about, you know, how brick and mortar is going away. How many stores are, you know, shut down here in the city of Chicago right now? Sears have gone the way of Montgomery Wards. If you don't try to find new revenue streams, the casinos, the marijuana is not going to do it. We forget about the back doors with marijuana, the money laundering that would occur. So we're going to legitimize a lot of... Um, 
cartels that are making their money and, and will literally wash their money as they're doing in Colorado. And we do not talk about the crime that comes along with a lot of that legitimizing of marijuana in Colorado. But Christina, who do you think after tonight may decide to drop out? Didn't do so well. This, you know, they found out they're in a little bit too deep from this forum. I mean, I think it's really difficult. It, this was, you know, Vallis had said something about this is a job interview, right? Mm -hmm. This is like doing a group interview. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's really hard to kind of stand out. And I mean, frankly, I was kind of disappointed that um, two main areas that I think have really been big issues that weren't talked about was the investments made in early childhood. And nobody spoke to that except at the very end, Vallis had said one thing. And I'm pretty surprised because Mayor Rahm Emanuel did significant investments. Whether you agree with them or not, that's a very important growth piece for our economy and also education and closing the achievement gap. The other piece was affordable housing. That came up nowhere. And that is such mm -hmm. a huge issue. And I was just really surprised. And so I'm just wondering, you know, with this whole kind of, we've got 13 to 15 candidates, mm -hmm. um, I think they need to do some reflection. And I think they need to make sure that they have the pulse um, check of the community and understanding that there's some major issues that did not get addressed and, tonight. You know, if I can address that, Mike, I think one of the things that's going to get determined tonight, folks who have money to spend on these candidates watching this debate and wondering, forum, and wondering who do I want to put my money behind? Now, folks like Bill Daly, he, he, you know, he, he's doing well. He's got money. Uh, Willie money Wilson in. has money. Money. But some of these candidates, I mean, uh, need money. People like Bob Fioretti, who's been an alderman of the second ward, who's, you know, served the city a lot. But if they don't get a bit of a groundswell of money behind them, that's going to push them out of the race. It won't be for the lack of their, their views. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, points to Amara and Susanna for making, sort of saying, I come from the neighborhoods. I grew up in this city. I let, several said that, but they really talked about their connection to growing up in these hoods. For a lot of people watching tonight, this was their first chance to see many of these candidates. Yes. Um, several of them made a point of being in this race before Rahm Emanuel dropped out. To them, that's important. Do you think that's important for people watching tonight, George? Absolutely. It's, again, leadership, courage. Um, Vallis actually called them a bunch of cowards that did not step into the race prior to that. And I think, again, in, in this climate, in this political climate, this is what people are looking for. Who has the courage? Who's actually going to be bold enough to take the next step and take us into the new economy? Who's going to be able to be, you know, come out with some bold, fresh ideas that will actually help Chicago grow and become that melting pot that we used to be? Mm -hmm. Christina? Yeah, no, I think that it's really, um, it's just really interesting in terms of like how the discussion progressed over time. And I think it's really important to kind of point out that in this kind of space, in this field, you have so many people that came out. And actually, we were just talking about this, right? In that we want to see something different. Yes. And you have, it's, it's a large city, but we have kind of a small political circle and you see people being recycled. And so <laughs> I think that's kind of an interesting mm -hmm. point and dynamic of Chicago in this particular race. I like how you say that people are being recycled and it, it's definitely, there are a lot there who have been recycled, but there were some newcomers that we talked about. Let's talk a little bit about the fact that they talked about Ed Burke, who's recently indicted uh, charges and he's been an alderman forever, head of the finance committee forever. Let's listen to what they had to say about that. I, too, believe that aldermen should serve in a full-time capacity. They make plenty of money. Um, they get uh, compensated more than accordingly. And I think that we have to look at this holistically and say, you know, we can't have elected officials who are running for office to profit themselves. Anyone who wants to run for public office should be motivated by one simple desire, and that's to make people's lives better. And every day when I wake up... Can, if I could comment on that, because Burke was such a critical question, we opened up pretty much with mm -hmm. that question. Bill Daly, we didn't use sound from him because he just avoided the question. Yes. Uh, he stepped away from it and... and Wonder why. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, well, they all had ties. I mean, he did make he yeah. did make the tie. To his credit, there's hardly anybody up here who probably doesn't have some tie to Ed Burke, and then so I'll shift to my agenda. But uh, the reason I like Susanna Mendoza's, uh, the use of her response here for us, is the fact that she basically, what she was referring to is that Ed Burke's problem is what was he gaining personally from his role in government and so there are so many people but but that alone is not illegal in this state or even unethical it is it is okay to have a property tax law firm while you are serving as an alderman in the city council and chair of the finance committee mike madigan has the same deal up at the state legislature so she raised the point simply saying look they need to be full-time we need to get rid of their opportunity to do these outside outside jobs i think that's an appealing argument once people understand that they're allowed to do this anyway who do you think gets to hurt hurts the most by the burke situation and and is it possible that this gets worse as we get closer to the election? Christina, we'll start with that. It's toxic. I mean, and, and unfortunately, it takes away from the issues. I, I'm, I, 
corruption is an issue in our city, corruption is an issue in our state, um, but what it really does is distract us from really addressing the issues that we need to address and coming up with solutions, community driven solutions, root cause going straight to that root cause of the problem and so I mean I think we do need to address it through ethics I, we need to do it through training we need to make sure that we bring forth people that are ethical that are authentic that come from the city and that are going to make some changes mm -hmm. George honestly the people that were hurt by this Tony Perkwinkle Bill Daly because again their their political ties in that small political circle that mm -hmm. that thinkdom that they've created here in Chicago but to your point about you know whether or not if this is, should be legal or not. It is illegal if you're actually forcing people to turn to the, your business, and that is what the tapes will actually play out. So yeah, well, that's what, what it takes. Saying, to play the tapes. But well, what about <laughs> Susana Mendoza, though, too? Remember, she's got something that says he was her mentor. Mm -hmm. I think she was married, she married in his, in his house. house. Yeah. 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 So don't you think she could get hurt by him, too? Yeah. Yeah. Susana's got some other issues outside of the fact that she's collecting the check for being comptroller and you know, already running to be. Which Willie city. Wilson brought yeah, up. Yeah. Right. And, and you, uh, and I just got to say, I mean, the look. friendship part is one thing. Taking the money and then the business development, yeah. that, that is what's going to be the key and who else is on those and, and As Bill Daly said, we all had, you know, everybody's got ties to her. But uh, let me just say one thing for Tony Preckwinkle because, the, you know, this notion that uh, Burke had a, had a fundraiser, for, or actually, sorry, uh, requested that this Burger King guy that's all messed up, that they write a, a check to Tony Preckwinkle, totally Preckwinkle, that whole mess. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. I talked to Alderman Scott Wagaspack in the 32nd Ward about that on Politics Tonight. And he did say mm -hmm. that um, a couple of months ago, a period of time ago, he asked Tony, would you appoint Ed Burke chair of the Finance Committee again? And she said yes. Now, to her credit, now, of course, she said, no, I wouldn't, and he's out. But of about course. a month ago, before this scandal broke, Scott asked Tony again, and she did at that time say, I don't think so. I think she, she, she was already on her own changing her opinion of Ed Burke and what role he should play, the even before the scandal broke. So mm -hmm. I think she's got the most to pay, but I think at least you have to give a full ear uh, and hearing to her position on it, which would have been nice to get. But well, if you think she hadn't heard already at that point yeah. about the indictments coming down, mm -hmm. and again, in that area, you're going to hear secrets like that. There, You can only keep indictments and, and, and closed sessions going for just so long, and I guarantee you she heard about it, and that's why she changed her answer. There were a lot of talk tonight, too, about not having outside jobs. Do you think that's something that that comes through? Or? Yes, at the they're making a, the lowest paid is one hundred four thousand dollars a year. Yes, it should be a full time job or cut the salary and make and, and allow them to stay part time. And well, given given the state of our city, I mean, you have to focus your attention just on that specific work. And look, there's a historical reason for all of this. Years ago, when you couldn't live on that salary, so people had to be farmers. But, you know, it's yeah. the same rule for for the legislature in Springfield as well. So there's reasons behind it, but it's not a bad idea to revisit that today and ask whether or not if these are folks are making a, over a hundred thousand dollars a year. You know, a lot of people in the city would like to make that kind Absolutely. of salary mm -hmm. and and so to, and to serve the people the other thing is you don't typically go for a job like that because you're out to be rich that shouldn't be one of the things that motivates you mm -hmm. so you should have enough money to live take yeah. care of your family and then do the people's yeah. work and not worry so much about how else can I make money especially with something that creates even what would be an appearance of impropriety let alone an impropriety they talked about term limits too. talked about crime we're gonna get to all of that when we come back after the break In Riverdale, an eighth grader, Jaira Griffin, raises money for a free wash day at a neighborhood laundromat so parents can send their kids to school with cleaner clothes. Six months after Hurricane Maria ravaged Puerto Rico, local volunteers and electrical workers were still headed to that island to bring supplies and help turn the lights back on. These are Chicago's very own stories. And we're telling them every night. Watch Micah and Joe, weeknights on WGN News at 9. Do you know a teacher who uses innovative techniques in the classroom or has made unique contributions to the community? WGN.